Can I have sex with your wife? I do it, guys. Oh my god, I'm in public doing this. Uh, grab a blanket, turn off your lights. Four, four true scary stories that happened. That are kind of weird. Can I have sex with your wife? Please. Nice guys, I have this thing that I do, it's simply called drinking way too much tea, like to the point where I actually have a whole cupboard stuffed with jars filled with loose leaf tea, and I have at least three boxes of tea bags kept in my room for when I don't want to get up and make a new pot all the time. It's gotten to the point that when I go into a local tea shop, the staff greet me and ask if I like more of their black blood orange tea or perhaps their green dragon mix which I tend to buy often. Even the staff at the local supermarket recognize me now, because I always buy the same boxes of tea bags. They hired a new guy at the local tea shop. Let's call him Tom. He seemed like a nice guy, very enthusiastic about things, and seemed to fit in well with the staff. He was helpful, and he got familiar with our stock real fast. He actually introduced me to some of their own tea, a mix they called Sea Breeze. I didn't think twice about talking to him, I talked to everyone else in the shop, and I've been going there for years. Not to mention that it was the only only town around for miles that even had a tea shop of its own. Besides, Tom was really... nice. After about two months, Tom asked me out. It came sort of out of the blue, especially considering that we didn't know each other. I told him that I wasn't interested and that I recently got out of a pretty bad breakup and just didn't want to date anyone for a while. He seemed to take it fine, just said, yeah, I get that, and dropped it. At least I thought he dropped it. Maybe a week after that, I came to the supermarket to get some more tea bags. I didn't really pay much attention to anything, just dropped it by the cashiers and grabbed my wallet. When I was about to take my card out to pay, I suddenly heard a very familiar voice laugh and say, hey you, Lady Grey, right? You love that blend. Tom was sitting there, Dressed in the uniform of the staff, I got a little thrown off, seeing as how the supermarket hardly ever hired anyone new. Believe me, I'd asked many times while looking for a job. Didn't know you worked here, I told him, and he smiled at me. Yeah, I got a job here just the other day. Apparently one of their staff up and quit, so they needed someone, and well, I have a friend of a friend. I didn't ask more about it. This went on for a while, seeing Tom both at the tea shop and the supermarket. When it came to a ladder, though... I always seemed to arrive just as a shift was almost up, and he'd asked if he could walk with me for a bit. I always told him that it wasn't a good idea, because I had quite a long way home, and he normally got around by car. Whenever he'd asked this, I always got a weird feeling. You know, when there's this one person you always really feel pretty indifferent about, but whenever they ask you something like this, you feel like you have to make an excuse to get away, that's it. For all that was, it was fine to talk to him. Tom? But something made me feel I shouldn't walk anywhere with him. I lied when I said I had a long way to go. Truth be told, I live maybe 10 minutes from the supermarket, but it's a little out of the way, in a secluded area of the town, and where few people live. Lots of abandoned houses, and the apartment building where I live is pretty much the epitome of no one there to help, or rather, no one who care to help. Besides, being a pretty small girl, about one who works out and has a good deal of muscle, I wasn't really comfortable with the thought of being in a secluded place with anyone bigger than me. Little by little, I could tell that Tom was getting frustrated about me saying no all the time. He'd get this pinched look on his face, and he'd use a very flat voice when saying, yeah, it's fine. When i come to the tea shop, he'd ask his boss if he could have a short break, just so he could talk to me for a bit. When this had been going on for a while, his boss at the tea shop once took me aside when he wasn't at work and asked for a word. She started asking me if Tom was a bother to me and if he'd been doing anything untowards, so to say. I admitted that he made me uncomfortable when he asked to be alone with me. You're the only customer he does this with, she told me. He seems really indifferent to anyone else. I mean, yeah, he helps them, but he doesn't seem so enthusiastic with them. This started setting off proper warning bells in my head and I asked her if perhaps I could know when he actually worked so I could come in when he wasn't there. I wasn't about to stop going there just because of him. She agreed and gave me his schedule, even her own phone number, so I could call her if something was up. Let me tell you, 
Tom got really irritated when he didn't see me at the tea shop anymore. If I went to the supermarket, he'd be pushy about asking me where I was and why I wasn't there. You go like every week, he'd say. Why do I never see you? I pulled some bullshit story about my routine needing a change and how my work hours didn't work with the old one anymore and I could tell he didn't believe me. So about another month went by, he kept asking why he didn't see me more often and why I wouldn't take a walk with him. Then one morning, I got a letter in the mail. Just the wording alone told me it was him, though the content itself was pretty... was pretty obvious. You're such a liar. Your routine needed a change? Your work hours didn't fit? You always lied to me. You work from home, you told me that. You work from home and you can go get tea whenever I saw you, you know? I was in my car outside the tea shop and you showed up when I wasn't working. Why are you avoiding me? Aren't I nice to you? I thought girls like that. When guys are actually nice to them, guess you're just another little bitch who wants bad boys or whatever. Okay, yeah, that was out of line. Still, can't you just come in as you used to? I just want to talk. And why not just walk a little with me? I can always just walk back to my car, you know? Maybe I could give you a ride home. Not like I don't know where you live anyways. I like talking to you. You pay attention. You listen. You give me a chance, yeah? You can't be still hung up over your ex. It's been ages. If you're gonna move on from an asshole, move on with a nice guy. I like to say that I freaked out and made a fuss. I didn't. I just picked the phone, called the owner of the tea shop and explained about Tom and the letter. The owner stated that, he had stopped coming in to work lately altogether, and that she was going to fire him at any rate. This was just the last nail in the coffin. She promised that she was going to talk to him about it, and tell him that he was lucky I hadn't called the police yet. Well, she did, and it didn't stop. I kept getting letters. When I saw him at the supermarket, he'd be agitated, and he'd just try harder than before to get me to walk with him. Once, it got to the point where he grabbed my arm and tried to convince me to just come with him, to let him show me something. Luckily at that point, there were security guards around. They went over to us and asked me if there was a problem. I only had to look at Tom to make him let go. I think he knew that if he kept going or tried to claim that we knew each other well, I would tell them. Then came that last night, when I had been to the supermarket pretty late. I had been wrapped up in work for a few days and hadn't had time to go to the shop, so I ran down to the supermarket to pick up food and other necessities that I was missing. And Tom was there, not working, but just waiting for me when I came out with heavy bags in my arms. He didn't approach. I just passed him by, hoping to convey that I was in a hurry and headed out. I got maybe halfway home when I looked over my shoulder and saw his car stop just around the corner. Convinced that he was now following me and hoping to catch me alone, I decided to take a shortcut home. There's a path that cuts through the forested area around where I live, and it's a very narrow one. Difficult to walk along with shopping bags, but at least it will let me get out of sight for a bit. I hurried down the next corner, listening for the sound of the car as it started up again, and dodged into the forest. I crouched down behind a bush for a while, and I heard the car drive up and down the road several times. I'll admit that I felt triumphant that such a small faint could throw him off. He apparently didn't know where I went. The path is hard to see if you don't know where it, where it is, so perhaps he was unaware of its existence. After a bit, I got up and hurried along. Getting home wasn't very difficult at all, and I thought it was over and done with. But when I got inside and went up the stairs, I looked out through one of the windows in the stairwell. His car was just coming up the road towards my car. I ran, as best as I could, up the stairs and hurried into my flat and slammed the door. Now I was truly freaked out. It was easy enough to deal with it before. Letters could be shredded or burnt, and the shops were always manned with staff or security, but this was entirely different. Now he was at my house. I had locked the door behind me, and while I was unpacking the groceries, I heard the handle being turned and the door being pulled at. I didn't react much. The lock was new. The door was sturdy, so no one could get in unless I opened the door for them. There was just one problem. The mail slot. I heard it squeak as it was pushed open, and I heard his voice. Where are you running from? It's just me. I didn't answer. I, I, I just stood still in the, in the kitchen and listened. There were continuous scratching noises coming from the door now, and he kept talking, telling me he wasn't going to do anything bad, that he just wanted to see me. The longer I stood there and did nothing, the more aggressive he got. 
It sounded like he was going to try to kick the door down, all the while shouting about how I was a bitch, how unfair I was being to him, and how I got him fired. The last one, yeah, fair enough. The rest, not so much. Then the noise just abruptly stopped. I thought for a moment that maybe a neighbor had gone out into the stairwell to tell him to shut the fuck up and leave. I waited a while longer, just standing there and listening intently, until I finally managed to relax and move again. I moved towards the hallway, hoping that I was moving really quietly to go to my little office. I was right in front of the door when the mail slot squeaked open again and a hand dropped something in through it. It was a burning cloth and I could smell the stench of gasoline. I began screaming. I ran to fetch water to put the fire out and as I did, I heard Tom laughing outside my door. Fucking knew you were in there, you bitch! Though I managed to put the fire out, he wasn't leaving. I called the police and they told me there was no patrol available to help. The fastest they could get to me was in two hours. I was stuck there in the flat with his creep outside my door, shouting threats and abuse at me for two whole fucking hours. All this while, none of the neighbors came to help. When the police did arrive, they arrested Tom. Apparently, there had been several more calls, all from my neighbors. The reason they didn't come to help was that they were worried that he was somehow armed, and well, can't blame him. I was told later on that the police did find a machete in Tom's car, as well as three cans of gasoline and a lot of matches. He could have gone at any point to fetch any of those. There's more. It turns out that the only reason Tom was ever hired by anyone was that he used a fake name. Technically, he didn't exist. Hence, why no one ever found anything criminal about him. But the police found him in their database eventually. He had done this in another town, to another girl. She wasn't quite so lucky. He'd been to jail for what he had done to her, but had gone out early on good behavior. I don't know the full details of the other incident, but I know that she lived, though when she was found, she was so badly burnt that she was unrecognizable. Can I have sex with your wife tonight? Like most women, I've had a lot of creepy encounters with men. Most have been your general leer and follow, a couple wildly inappropriate flirtations from adults when I was a kid, and millions of smile, you're much prettier when you smile. Luckily avoided much true danger until funnily enough, I was married. Most of the flirtations and you simply must let me paint you stop when I got married because apparently the perverts I attract respect the sanctity of marriage. So it's funny that my scariest story happens when my husband was sitting right next to me. We were coming back from a holiday in Europe and arrived very late to the airport. We live in the UK and public transportation shuts down around midnight, except for buses which tend to be Creep City. There is a taxi company based in the airport, so we just arranged to take their next available driver, more expensive, but safer and less stressful than getting on a bus. Or so we think. So the next available driver comes up to us, introduces himself. He's kind of a ratty looking guy, probably in his 50s or 60s, but he's looking like an aging band member. Actually, he looks a bit like Charlie Watts. He seemed nice enough though. I mean, it's the official airport taxi service, so we're presuming these are decent drivers. Everything is pretty normal when we first get in his car. He kind of makes fun of the people who are waiting for the cheaper taxis outside the airport, but he's just being cheeky. At some point, he tells us he had problems, lots of problems in the past, and keeps it vague. Me and my husband just nervously laugh and try to relate, even though we're both kind of boring straight arrows. So, he tells us he was at a nightclub over the weekend that had two floors, and that a woman fell over the railing while he was there. He tells us the story laughing, and I asked if she was okay. He says, well, I didn't stick around to find out and tells us that the woman was his date, and he imitates that he pushed her. He says like, I was right next to her, you know, and I just watched her go down, and then I made sure I was gone before the police arrived. He's telling us all this and just cackling away. At this point, I'm thinking he's just funny. Like, this is a completely made up story, and he's just being whimsically dark, I guess. He then tells us more weird stuff that I can't really remember, but nothing quite as strange as that. The whole time we're both awkwardly laughing and trying our best to sound like we're not judging this guy. 
The guy goes from funny and weird guy who makes us slightly uncomfortable to should I tuck and roll the hell out of this taxi really quick. He tells us about his son and daughter and how I don't really talk to him much anymore, but he tells us that we remind him of his son and daughter. He asks us how old we are, when we met, stuff like that. Then he tells us how nice it is to see such a beautiful young couple who aren't judgmental like everyone else, and then drops the bomb. I'm going to ask you a question. Can I have sex with your wife tonight? Silence. Silence. Peal of howling laughter from our driver. More awkward giggling from us. Okay, well, that's just fine. He's being cheeky, I guess. He's laughing. It's all good. So I'm on edge because I know we're at his mercy on a winding country road. I forgot to mention that this wasn't the city airport we were coming from. It was one of the more rural airports in England, and we lived in a small town at the time. So narrow winding roads, surrounded by forest for a large part of the trip. We get more near our town, and he says, Oh yeah, I live around here too. Do you guys mind if I go home to make sure I turned all the lights out? Yeah, we minded. But what the hell could we say? My husband is English, and therefore can't verbalize complaints, and I'm scared silent. So one or both of us just say, yeah, sure. He thanks us for understanding. I'm thinking about how BTK asks his victims to understand his sexual problems. We drive into a pretty nice neighborhood, and there are some lights on in the house, so our driver gets out. I say as soon as I see him go in the house, hey, be prepared to fight, because he definitely might come out with a knife. My husband says, oh, I don't think so, but okay, yeah. After we survived all this and I asked him, do you really not think he might try and abduct us? My husband told me, yeah, he did think that was a possibility. He just didn't want to make me more scared. In the future, husband, boyfriends, whatever, we're already shitting our pants at this point. It's okay to say, yeah, I'm ready to fight this guy. Don't worry, I can take him. Rather than try to make us not scared anymore, his intentions were good, but my husband's lack of fear and seeming oblivious just made me more scared, thinking this guy was going to surprise him. Well, the story ends with the guy getting back in the car, my body being incredibly tense and ready to lunge forward or roll out the taxi, but he just says, thanks guys, and we go about our business, no stabbing. He continues to be creepy, don't get me wrong. He asked us if we'd like to break into some gated subdivision with him. He offers to ram the gates with his car, and we can explore it all together. And then he asks us if we'd like to rent his apartment because we're such a nice couple and he'd give us a deal. Basically weird stuff. But he is driving us back home now. We get out of the car, he compliments us for not being judgmental, and tells us we're a great couple that made him happy. Then he even gave us a hug. For the next few weeks, I'm looking outside to see if he's waiting down in the parking lot for us, and he never is. One of the benefits of living in an apartment complex is that I know he couldn't possibly know our exact flat number. I think back at that weird experience now, and I wonder if it could have actually gone really wrong. Like, if we had been a judgmental couple, if we wouldn't have laughed when he told us about his heroin addict, or his potential nightclub negligent fatality, would that trip to his house have ended with zip ties and a knife? Or had I been a single woman, would he have asked if he could have sex with me? Or was I being paranoid? Was he just a cheeky guy with a weird sense of humor who was desperate to save money on his electricity bill? Mossy Glen Hollow. This happened three years ago today on the DAT. I've been trolling through the subreddit for a little while now, and was reminded of this encounter by a notification from Google this morning. Google Photos sends out these kinds of notifications X number of years after you take a lot of pictures, and that day sure was one of them. This will have more lead up than most stories on here, but the context is pretty central to everything here. It is a really long one too, so saddle up kiddos. I've also attached any, um, any information in case you guys have any questions for me. First, a bit of background. This all went down during the spring break of my junior year of high school. My school was in a pretty small Iowa town, with a district spanning several smaller hamlets. During the summer of 2014, 
A few friends of mine put together a film club that would make short films and compete in national film festivals against other schools. We were a pretty small group and found it kind of difficult to get together for any actual filming until spring break of 2015 when we made plans for a little excursion. Four of us ended up going on the trip. Myself and three, three members of the club, let's call them Jake, Bill, and Kyle. We ended up choosing to go camping out at Mossy Glen Hollow, a supposedly haunted state park up in northeastern Iowa. Since the 1850s, there have been several murders and suicides out at Mossy Glen, including a few decapitations and a hired hitman in the 1930s. Being the edgy teens that we were, we jumped at the chance to go hiking and camping somewhere like that. It was within 15 minutes of a small town as well, so stocking up on food wouldn't be that big of an issue either. So all lights green, we loaded up our two sedans, programmed the GPS, and off we were for a spring break camping in some haunted woods. After the first hour and a half on the road, a few red flags began to fly after the last large town before getting way out in the boondocks. My phone's data signal cut out, and the GPS randomly changed directions on us. Since none of us had any idea where in the hell we were, or where Mossy Glen was supposed to be, we didn't have much choice but to blindly follow the new route. To save on continuity, I'm going to throw this section at the end. It's not really important to the story, but can give a bit of perspective on how places like Mossy Glen end up in the legal state that this place was in. Once you were firmly in the middle of nowhere, our GPS took us off to the paved highways and onto gravel roads. At this point, you would typically see the usual brown Iowa DNR signs designating that you were near a state park, but there were none. There weren't even any tree clumps to indicate that you were near some sort of forest. Red flag number two. Another ten minutes or so into the drive, and the gravel road soon turns to a dirt road, then a low-maintenance road, then a Class B minimum maintenance road. With Iowa's dedication to road preservation, this basically means that somebody probably came by and took a peek in the 90s and then probably forgot about its existence. As we come around the last hilly bend that the GPS shows on our route, we see a farmhouse with a large machine shed with no lights or activity around either and no cars in the driveway. A bit weirded out that a house would be right next to a state park, we slow down and keep rolling. To our dismay, however, the road dissolves into a huge mess of washed tractor tire gouges from last fall's harvest. We stop the cars as far down as we can pass without getting hung up on a frozen rut and unpack some of our equipment. The road gradually narrows, snakes now in the middle of a field, and turns down into the small but very thick clump of woods at the bottom of a wide ravine. We get out and hike down the gradually steepening slope and take in the scenery as a whole. At first, Everything looks pretty damn cool, and it looks like a pretty cool set to film at. There are several limestone outcrops hanging off of the hillside, a footpath with some picturesque trees overhang, and even a few birds out that made a unseasonal return from wintering down south. We can all hear some water running, but can't identify a source from the trail. Looking off in any direction, all we could see was a seemingly endless sea of trees at the bottom of the hill was a small pond in the middle of a grassy clearing with a fence. As we approached the fence, we noticed the sign, Private Property, Keep Out. Bill checks his watch and realizes that it was almost time for dinner, so we trek back to our vehicles and hook up the GPS. The nearest town over was a little place called Edgewood that had several diners and a gas station to load up on supplies for the week. We bought some canned food, but not much beyond that. As we got to town, we realized that Edgewood was a lot smaller than we had expected. Less than 900 people, it would turn out. Everyone knows everyone in these small towns. So we got several weird looks when four strangers rolled up with plates from the other side of the state. Kyle thought to ask the cashier and a few people at the gas station about Mossy Glen Hollow and why the only route in was through some dude's fields on a busted out dirt road. To our surprise, Nobody had ever heard of a place called Mossy Glen, nor could they figure out why the hell four high schoolers suddenly rolled in town looking for the place. Red flag number three, we shrug it off at just the crazy few locals and take back down the dirt trail. As we round the corner back near the farmhouse, we notice that all the lights are still off and nobody seems to be home. 
I suggest that we leave some sort of note on the house door and that we are going to be parking on the side of the road near their place just to be safe. It is starting to get late in the day, and being this far out in the country, it wouldn't be unheard of to come face to face with a shotgun when the homeowners find our cars. Since the roads is impassable from that point on anyways, parking there wouldn't realistically block anybody off of the road and would technically still be on public land. We hike back down the wooded trail and start scouting for a place to set up camp for the night, making sure to be on the public side of the fenced pond area. We discover that the sea of trees that we saw earlier was actually quite a bit thinner when seen from below. In fact, the dirt path led to a decently sized clearing with a creek and small waterfall cutting through the limestone deposits. None of us could believe that we had missed such a thing a few hours earlier. When Bill comes to a realization, he disappears around the corner back into the trees and emerges at the top of the trail a few minutes later. Though we could plainly see him, the trees lined up just so that he could not see anybody beyond the rocks below the path ledge. Continuing upon the creek, we notice that there are conveniently placed rocks about the perfect distance apart to step without disturbing the water or the surrounding rocks. One could walk almost silently up and down the creek while the sound of the water masked the steps. Not thinking much of it, we take some pictures of the large moss-covered boulders all around and get some pretty nice scenic shots. We find a place to make camp and everything is going great until we approach the waterfall. Just before the waterfall, sat a clearing without any large boulders or rocks and an odd arrangement of logs. One sat horizontal, supported at each end by two piles of rocks. In front sat a crude stone circle with a pile of burnt logs inside a fire pit with a bench. Though a bit surprised at first, we shrugged it off as some weekend project that the people up at the house put together. After all, with such a cool place, just a short walk from home, why not? I have a similar fire pit set up at home, so I'm not too concerned. Hey, what the hell is this? Kyle yells from a boulder a few yards ahead. On it sat a blaze orange beanie, a single gardening glove, an empty can of beer, and a stick of deodorant that seemed to have some serious wear. Looking closer at the beer can, we realized that it must have been opened fairly recently. Foam is still fresh on the bottom of the can, and it still had that fumy smell. Bewildered by what the hell we just found, Jake starts looking around the other side of the boulders upstream of the items. Holy shit, there's a cave over there, he shouts back to us. Later, he told us that the cave was large enough to comfortably fit a person inside, and that, more disturbingly, he saw some red fabric inside as well. Before he can get a good look around, Kyle calls the three of us back over to him with a sense of urgency. He speaks very quietly to us and indicates that we shouldn't shout back. Shampoo, fucking shampoo, he whispers, pointing urgently down at his feet. Sure enough, in the mud and leaves, there's a blue bottle of suave shampoo right next to the creek. At this point, we're all adequately freaked the fuck out and ready to call our little sorry quits. Bill remains pretty sure that this is just junk left behind by the people up at the house after a weekend of a few too many bush lights, but things just didn't add up to me. There's one detail that I might be leaving out at this point. The day before, this part of Iowa got some heavy rain, which contributed to the mud situation on the road and on the trail. With a combination of wind and rain, the items on the rocks would have shown some signs of being wet, if not displaced entirely at that point. Also, the air was pretty cold, as it is every year around this time, not getting above the mid-40s for the whole week. Then everything starts to click for me. Whoever drank the beer and left the shampoo, hat, glove, deodorant, and shampoo down there must have done so sometime this morning. The fire pit had fresh char marks on the rocks, and the wood had not been wet for a while, meaning that it must have been lit last night at the earliest. The small cave would have provided enough shelter from the rain to stay dry. With the freezing temps all throughout the day, whoever was using shampoo out here must have had little choice to do so. If it was the homeowners, it would have taken serious balls to bathe in the shallow, freezing, rocky creek rather than at home if it wasn't them. Then we likely weren't alone right now. Whoever left these things out left in a hurry, and they were here four hours ago. They would have been able to see us on the trail cliff long before they even knew they were down here. 
Remembering the arrangement of rocks on a stream, they could have even been leaving their camp just as we were coming down the dirt trail. As I processed all of this, I started to look around at my surroundings and realized that the small area was bordered by the thick trees on the trail side, several sets of huge boulders on the pond side, and limestone cliffs everywhere else. Due to the tree, rock, and hill cover, you could light a fire in the pit at night and nobody around would ever even know. The illusion of being able to see up the dirt trail from the camp, but not down, played in reverse from the cliffs. If you were wearing brown or green, you could easily see down from the rocks on top to the camp, while blending in with the trees above. Coming to these realizations, I noticed something else. Something more sinister. The birds and small animals that were previously heard are now quiet. Aside from the soft babble of the creek, the entire place is completely silent. As I start to explain this to the rest of the group, I see the wheels turning in their heads as well. Jake starts to head back to the small cave when a rustling up on the limestone ridge line catches our attention. Something large was shifting around up there, something that apparently didn't want Jake to see what was in that cave. We all look up and whatever, whoever made the noise, starts shuffling down the ridge towards the makeshift camp. Because of the high cliff, the only way down to us would be by going all the way back down to the pond and then double back up the stream. Realizing this and almost shitting ourselves at how open we were, we book it back up the stream, up the dirt path, across the field and back to our cars. On the drive back to Edgewood, we all tried to process what the fuck just happened back there. I took a look at its satellite map, and the only really accessible way to the cliff where we heard the noise would be to walk up there from the pond. It was too craggy to approach from the adjacent field to the east. Whatever made that noise would have had to be large too and a deer getting up there wouldn't necessarily be out of the question. It would have had some incredible timing to have started moving around just as Jake started looking at the cave and whatever red fabric was inside of it. Kyle found a report of an escaped convict from a local prison a few weeks ago and was convinced that it was his camp that we found, though we were all doubtful, at best, of this idea. To satisfy his concerns, we agreed to report the strange things we found to the police anonymously since we all really just wanted to get home at this point. None of us follow up on them though, and I doubt anything ever came out of it. A small close-knit town police department gets a report of strange sightings from some stranger the same day that four high schoolers roll up and park outside a farmer's house for a few hours and then book it out doesn't exactly spell high threat criminal activity to me. Still, things still just don't seem to add up. Whoever came running down that cliff if it indeed was a who, wanted to keep whatever was inside that cave, hidden, but not enough to actually fight four decently tall and able teenagers. We figured he just wanted to scare us off since the noises seemed to stop once we reached the dirt path. I thought it odd that someone living out in the woods would, with something seemingly to hide to be honest, would set up shop in a state park. That is, until I checked my GPS again. That little reroute that it took us on was an old entrance to the park that had been cut off by the purchase of the lake area, sometime between the map records used for Google's navigation being updated in that day. The current entrance to the park is about two miles north of where the GPS sent us, thinking it found a faster route. The place we were at was still public land for sure, but not quite what we pictured, so. Dude in Mossy Glen Hollow. Let's not meet.